We're going to begin with two musicians playing. Uh, oh, uh, Ed's trying to uh, get people to sit. It's Mohammed and Hadi Eldebek. They are brothers, educators, entrepreneurs, and excellent musicians. They'll be playing music from the Arab world, and they'll give you a little explanation of what they're doing. Thank you very much. We're very happy to be here and to take part in this um, event and support such a great cause. Um, you know, we like we like the people of Yemen. We like the uh, culture of Yemen and with all of its music and rhythms and uh, and food and hanith. <laughs> if uh, if you don't know what that is, you should go check it out. So we're going to uh, give you a little bit. Uh, of an explanation or um, invite you to the culture of Arabic music um, and to the instruments that is, are also played in Yemen. And we're going to start with a piece of music called Georgina Hosseini on a scale called Georgina. called oud. It's uh, an essential and a primary instrument in the classical Arabic music. And this instrument is called uh, tabla or uh, babuka. Depends where it comes from. Exactly. 
So, you know, across the Arab world, when you travel, you um, experience different rhythms. When you say Arabic music, we actually, we're not very accurate because Arabic music from where, really, you know? The music from Iraq is very different from the music in the Levantine, uh, from the music from Egypt and Gulf countries and Morocco. So this uh, piece we played is actually uh, more an Iraqi piece. It has the Georgina feel, so the count is in 10. Whereas mo most of the counts and the rhythms in the Levantine is in four. So instead of counting a cycle of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we're doing a count of ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is a little bit technical. We're gonna stop there. We're gonna move. We're gonna, we're gonna move to um, to uh, to Morocco actually and uh, sing a song on which you could actually sing back with us. Uh, there's a popular song that's known in most of the Arab world, uh, world called Halla uh, Halla Ya Baba. And that's from Tunis. Yes, there you go. You're out of control. I don't think I can control you. So, can we say, I'm gonna say Ya Baba. Can you say Ya Baba? It's a term of endearment. You know, in India, they use this a lot. Like, you know, Mo Baba, Hadi Baba. You know, it's like my dear friend, my dear Hadi, etc. So apparently it's similar also in, in Tunisia. I didn't know that before. And it so that it means Baba, Father. It doesn't really, uh, it's not really, uh, it's more of a uh, term of endearment. So when I sing, Halla, Halla, Ya Baba, Wislam Ali, Ya Baba, Halla, Halla, Ya Baba. Ya Baba, Wislam Alik, Ya Baba, Sidi Mansoor, Ya Baba, Niji Kinzur, Ya Baba, Sidi Mansoor, Ya Baba, Niji Kinzur, Ya Baba. You got this. Fantastic. All right, let's do it. Feel free to clap if you feel like it.
audience that they really loved your music and we thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we're going to rearrange the set a little bit here um, because we have two wonderful performers coming up, Karen Malpe and Kathleen Chalfant. Karen, Karen is a playwright, many of you know, a Brooklyn-based playwright who's also co-founder of the Theater 3 Collaborative. Uh, Kathleen Chalfant is the Tony-nominated actor uh, for the original Broadway production of Angels in America. They'll be doing a short play that Karen wrote called Dinner in Yemen. Uh, in Dinner, during Dinner, during Dinner during Yemen. Dinner during Yemen. Yemen. Sorry. And, uh, it was, uh, Karen was inspired um, by the events in Yemen now, and in fact, it was Karen who suggested that we have an event like this at the Commons. So, so we're all very, a lot of thanks to Karen. Are we picking up on the mic? Should be a little closer? I have a cold, so. Oh. Anyway, hi. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, you will hear one great actress, Kathleen Chalfant. in so many ways. Now we're ready. Um, so dinner during Yemen, Rita and Nita meet for dinner in the apartment of Rita. A terrible cry is heard. Is that an animal? 
Or a child. Why ever for? An animal. Must be. In a trap, perhaps? Animal-like? When they get that hungry, I suppose. That's what I meant, yes. Civilization is but a veneer. Why would anyone let their child starve? No one would let, I suppose. Not let, exactly. It's complex. Totally. Allegiances, patronage, family. Names difficult to pronounce. Well, it's over there. So much happens somewhere else. One can't keep things straight in one's head. Civil wars are the absolute worst. Oh, yes, so much suffering. For what? Would you pass the oysters on the half shell? <laughs> Moon shoals and Kumamoto. Afloat in their own juice. So smooth, sliding down the throat. I don't think they cry like that. Like what? What we just heard. A whimper, perhaps. That's what I meant. When they get weak. Must have been an animal caught in a trap. Unsettling, nevertheless. They turn their heads, unclench their little fingers and toes. Must be so terrible to watch. Oh, my goodness. I, I could not watch that. I change the channel. That's what I do. I meant if it were mine. Yours? Yes. How could that be? It couldn't, of course. Well, that's a blessing, is it not? However do such terrible things come to pass? Quite complex. I can't keep any of it straight. Pass the baked bath. So many people need our help. Absolutely divine braised buttery sauce. Yeah. Time's recipe. It's a proxy war. Why don't they just stop? That's what I cannot figure out. Simply open the ports. It's not helpful to criticize the Saudis. Quite right, I forgot. Saudi Arabia is our ally. Nobody makes what we make, and now we're selling it all over the world. Is that so? I'm quoting President Trump. Whatever was he talking about? Missile defense system. Ah, such a comfort there. The Houthis ah. shot a missile at Saudi Arabia. Iran gave it to them. That made everything worse. Our missile defense system, not their missile, right out of the sky. Well, of course it did. I'll take a piece of that roast beef. Please. <laughs> Tender. Grass-raised, organic. <laughs> if one's going to eat meat. In moderation, all our little sins. No one in Saudi was hurt. We can be thankful for that. Otherwise, who knows? That's the salt. Goodness, yes, World War Three. Yemen imports most of its food. Too arid to grow wheat, barley, oats. The Saudis have blockaded the ports. Well, one supposes they have no choice. As long as the Houthis, of course. The Shiite Houthi. Are they? Yazidi, yes. And the Saudis are Sunni. Wahhabi, Wahhabis. They don't like the Houthi. Wonder why that is. Well, the Houthi don't think much of them. The Houthi believe they're winning. Al-Qaeda, of course, is taking advantage. We've had to put boots on the ground. That's not so. Is that so? I suppose so. Airstrikes, I know about. Oh, airstrikes, of course. I'm full up. Me too. They might have been civilians. I don't think so. Yes, in the market, 52. Precision instruments, first-rate intelligence. Mistakes happen. The area is thick with insurgents. Civilians in their beds. They use civilians as human shields. Barbarians. I like this salted dark chocolate. There's cholera too. Chocolate's good for digestion. The United Nation fears mass starvation. Don't get me started. It's just a small piece. It's not terribly caloric. On the United Nations. Oh yes. Nobody <laughs> likes them. We had such great hopes once. <laughs> for world peace, yes. World peace. Yes. We can still wish. Well, we still do, of course. Let's toast to world peace in the new year.
Uh, we're going to go into something uh, not quite so uplifting. Uh, we have two speakers. Ibrahim Katabi uh, is a Yemeni American, uh, quite well known in the city and particularly in this in this area. He uh, does live in Brooklyn. He's currently uh, working for the Center for Constitutional Rights. And uh, just give us a moment, we'll get the, the PowerPoint up. And he'll be talking uh, a little bit about the history, brief history of Yemen, what the political situation is in there now, and particularly with the role that the United States is playing in Yemen. We're together, all in unity, right? I didn't know an awful lot uh, about Arabic music, so I thought that was pretty remarkable. Right? Everybody thought that was great? So what are we gonna do? Give. We're gonna give, and we're gonna be. We're gonna pay more attention to what's going on. We're gonna try to help in every way we can, because we're all human beings, right? And we respect each other, right? And as they're running through their technical difficulties, I used to have some great card tricks, but uh, I forgot them because I'm under a lot of pressure. Sing for us. Oh, yeah. Are you ready? Ready. <laughs> ready? Oh, same file. <laughs> same file. Speaker. Right. It's good to see everyone out here. Um, you got it. Um, I mean, after the music and the other part of it, which laid out the talk about specifically about Yemen. Um, I just want to ask, generally speaking, how many of you know something about Yemen besides the word right now? Um, can you tell me one thing that you know about Yemen? What about Sana? The capital. The capital. All right, let's hear something else. Debbie Amantas. All right, that's Yemen American. Has the worst color in the world now. Okay, it's a sad part. Arabic. Okay, so this is the basic things about Yemen. Yemen is the, uh, let me stand up, the birthplace of, um, of, Ar of, the, of Arabs. Um, it has the oldest city in the world right now. Uh, Sana'a still exists and it was built about six. Um, all right. uh, it was built about 6,000 years ago and people still live in there. Um, you also have the uh, first skyscrapers. Uh, we call them Manhattan of the Desert. Um, they in the south part of the country about 300 to 400 years. Um, buildings, 17 stories made of mud, and they still exist and people still live on them. They look similar to Manhattan. Um, we, I can show you the pictures. If we go to the next slide. Um, So anyway, it, it is also, um, we have Sugatra, it's an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It is one of the greatest, they call it the 10 wonders of the world. Um, it has uh, different spices, trees, like that, that didn't exist anywhere in, in, a, in the world. It's a UN protected island. It's currently occupied by the Arab coalition, the UAE in particular. Um, it, it also was called back in the day, the Arabian Felix. Um, it was green mountains, a lot of uh, trading happening there, so it was one of those spots in the world where people used to go um, to for food and other stuff and trading. Can you move to the second? Oh. All right, so I'll start by talking about the, um, so I'll talk about briefly about the history. A lot of people, in order to understand what's happening in, in, in the ground and the struggle of power, you need to know exactly what led to this, and I think this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. It's to give a little <coughs> brief history of how uh, Yemen evolved, and at least in the last 60 years, and why we have what we have today. So, before 1960s, there were about 12, what do we call, sultanates um, in the south part of the country, uh, little kingdoms run by certain families, and then now, in the north, we, have, we had the um, 
what they called it, the Kingdom of Yemen or the Mitwakli Kingdom of Yemen, was in the north part of the country, um, and a family called uh, the Hamid al Din family ruled that part of the country for about a thousand years. Not the particular family, but the same families. Um, so in 1960s, um, when we have similar to the Arab, the Arab Spring today, revolutions were declared in all across the Arab world, from Egypt to Iraq to uh, Libya to Yemen, exactly like what happened in the Arab Spring. Yemen was one of those uh, countries. Um, so 19, uh, in 1962, this is the old city, um, Sana'a. This is the Sana'a. It is like that since thousands of years ago. Uh, this is the uh, Saleh's hospital, is a new hospital, I mean the mosque, is a new mosque that are about a couple of years old, but this is the old city, it's part of the old city, but not the old city. Can you move to the next slide? This is what I call Manhattan of the Desert. Everyone, it's, it's the name of it, Manhattan of the Desert. Uh, looks on Manhattan, it's 17 stories, people still live there, made of mud, and it's in the middle of the desert. So this is how Yemen looked like. Um, this is, to me, this is why the struggle for power happening right now, because it is in a very important strategic location. It connects the east with the west. Most of the world trading and oil goes through uh, what we call the passaway of, of Aden, the canal of Aden. This is where, um, if Yemen is to develop in the right way and join the develop, developed world, um, it would, it, this part of the country would be one of the main important parts which turning um, this city, like the city of Aden, for example, into cities like Dubai, for example, right? Uh, so this is part of it. Uh, a lot of, there it was a struggle of power between East and West back, back in the day where, who can control this uh, water pass away? Yeah. Um, can you move to the next slide? So before, um, you know, the South and North before, we have the tribal system. This is a, still exists today. All these many colors are tribes. So every time we have a war in Yemen, the default system would be the tribal system. Meaning, they would control their lands, they will uh, make sure that there's security and order. It happens all the time. It happens actually even during uh, when we have established governments. Because one of the most peaceful things is the mediation that are uh, done by tribes. So if anyone kills somebody or a crime committed um, um, you know, by one tribe, and a third tribe will join in and try to mediate. And so they would resolve it in a most peaceful way and it's better than going to court. So everyone has like a win-win situation. So this is the tribal system. And right now it's the one that completely exists uh, given the war that has taken place. So people decide who, which part of the fighting they want to join or whether they don't want anyone to enter their land from the military or different uh, groups. But they also make sure that their tribes and their families are protected and have agreements with the, that are the groups that are fighting. Can you move the so like I was talking the 1960s there were two revolutions in the south and north of Yemen so the south of Yemen was controlled by like I said about 12 many uh, they call them the Sultanates like Sultanate Oman but it's like uh, kingdoms ruled by families the north was uh, a kingdom but ruled by one family the Hamid al Din family until 1962 this north part of the country, they created a revolution, they created a republic, they created a constitution. Um, people had uh, a constitution that are um, for the people, by the people. Um, and so it, it was declared a republic. They started there, this part of the country, not the whole entire south, was occupied by the British. They were controlling this part of the, the Aden um, seaport because they were pushing some sort of trade when we're, they were controlling India, when they were occupying India. So Aden was a strategic and important um, you know, uh, hub for the British to control. So they were controlling that part of the city, um, but they also were funding and taking care of the sultanates, the head of the sultanates, to make sure that they follow whatever the British told them and to actually use them as oppressors and their own people. Um, it is exactly this indirect sort of uh, occupation. Anyway, in 1962, the revolution happened in the, in the, in the north, uh, declared a republic. They help people in the south. They send uh, people to help them declare a revolution against the sultanates as well as the British. And in 1964, there were 
uh, very successful and they were able to push the British out. And as a result, it was the country by default was divided into south and north, where the north was the uh, Yemen uh, Arab Republic, the north was the People's uh, Democratic Republic. Um, so what happened at that time, we talked about the 1960s, um, there was the Cold War that came after. The south part of the country went toward the Soviet Union. The north were an ally of the U.S. in the, in the, in the west. And so uh, the rulers, and um, there, there were many incidents that happened between the 60s and the 70s uh, where a lot of presidents got assassinated or killed because uh, people said Saudi Arabia doesn't want to be part of it. They were funding certain groups and tribes to make sure that there's no real development and turning Yemen to a republic. So anyway, there was a lot of events that happened between there uh, until the 70s where the, the <laughs> Cold War was uh, happening between uh, 70s, 80s, between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The uh, rulers of the South adopted the, um, the socialism. So there was a socialist system and the South that transformed the whole society into socialist. So there was religion that didn't exist, it was everyone is equal, and there was like sort of a military, a strong government run by the military, but it's still a socialist uh, system. And the North was mainly a mix of civil society, tribals, people with ideas of becoming a republic and moving the country forward. There was a development here and there. But then there was a lot of killings on both sides within their own uh, states. So we didn't get to move a lot and to make a lot of progress until the Soviet Union uh, uh, collapsed. Um, the no South Yemen was becoming weak. North was becoming a little strong in a way, e economically speaking, because the South was su supported by the Soviet Union. Um, what happened at that time in the 1990s, even before that, they were in attempts by um, leaders from both sides to basically uh, trying to unite the country. Because Yemen was always a one part. Uh, that's the only name of it, Yemen. Um, anyway, so that happened between South and, and, and North. There was negotiation attempted in the 70s, 80s to bring the country together, but that didn't happen because, again, like it was happening today, a struggle between the West and the East, right? So until 1990, uh, leaders on both sides thought it was an important moment Let's bring the country back together and declare a unity. So it happened on uh, May 22, 1990, where both uh, sides became uh, the Republic of Yemen. So you can move to the next slide. Uh, this is how it looked like. Uh, they divided into two new states. They merged the whole system. Uh, the reason why we have a lot of states in the north because it's the most populated. It's almost like, you know, one to ten. Um, anyway, but most of the natural resources are also in, in, in the South. Um, 1990, unity happened. They established a great constitution. Um, again, um, it was like up to date, four term uh, presidential election, parliaments, and um, it was a real system that people thought to, um, you know, to move forward and to be part of the developed world. Um, and so there was a great movement, there was great elections. Uh, for the first time, people were able to establish political parties. There were about, I think in the first few days after uh, the unity, there were about 50 political parties declared, right? But the main ones were the socialists in the, in the, in, um, um, in the south, and the People's Congress, and the, uh, and the north. Anyway, that happened 1993. People in the north, I'm talking about the leadership, thought they becoming threatened because the socialist ideas in a way were spreading, uh, going through the north where people started trying to get out of the tribal system and controlled by religion and stuff like that. And the south was the opposite. They want to go back to religion. They thought, you know, that there was a lot of things that they were missing. And so Saleh was in charge. Saleh, I'm sure you know President Saleh was killed um, a few um, months ago. He was in control with a big tribe, the tribe called Hashid in the, in the north part of the country near the capital. They were in charge for a while. And so they thought it is time for them to use religion and to declare a war against the leaders of the south so they can capture the whole entire country into their own um, ruling. So Saleh and his family and tribe can be in charge um, of the country. Um, next, can we go to the next slide? So um, what happened then, um, 
started, to clear, uh, started assassinating the top ranking leaders of the Southern uh, leadership. Between 1994, he killed about um, 130 from the top leadership of the, you know, the party in the, in the South. And then they would push him back and said, we entered this unity so we can build the country together. But then they withdraw the leadership. They said, we're going to go back to pre-1990, pre-unity. Uh, that's where Saleh declared the war. At that time, 99%, I think, south and north were pro-unity. Everyone, every time people are pro-unity. So he, he won that war. There was a thousand-day war uh, between the Saleh troops and the, you know, the troops in the, in the south. The north won and became still one Yemen. And so people thought maybe for a good reason, you know, Saleh would consolidate power, but at the same time, we'll still go to the next election in 1994 and see how is that going to happen. But apparently Saleh dominated the whole thing. He was able to buy the tribe leaders, religious leaders, everyone across, and so he was the most famous. And also people thought maybe it's a good step going forward to develop the country. That didn't happen. At that time Saleh kept consolidating power. Uh, he ran the military, the, the judicial system, executive um, branch. So he was in charge of almost everything within the government, one family and his own tribe. They manipulated everything. They controlled the whole entire country. Election after election, he was winning by 80s and 90s, and people thought that was not a democracy. So, as a result, Saleh declared a war against what we call the Houthis today. They were in this part of the country. So I have five minutes left. I'm gonna try to go fast, uh, as complicated as it is. Um, so Sada is like where the Houthis come from. Uh, Saleh declared a war against them. They were trying to actually overthrow the, the, um, the government. Houthis come from a families of the Hamid ad din similar family. They related to the Prophet Muhammad. They think by default they have the God-given rights to control the country. Right? So the same families who were ruling the countries for a thousand years, they thought it was time to come back for them. They have to take the power back. So a struggle for power. So I declared, uh, declared uh, six words against them. They were fighting each other. And the call, uh, each word would end up with a phone call between both parties. Um, and, and 2007, uh, the Southerns felt they were excluded from the system, no leadership positions, they don't have access to the system, they, especially the military, um, heads of the military, started organizing a protest to basically regain their position that were removed after the 1993 war. Uh, they, they did it peacefully, that momentum gained some sort of support, uh, a real movement support, and that's where the Southern movement came from. Um, they started demanding that they just want to be to be treated as equal citizens, and that movement moved today toward like trying to regain our south uh, part of the country. That's what's happening today. Anyway, um, at that time, um, in 2007, the southern movement started. Houthis were was on and off between the uh, the the government and the Houthis, and then Saleh thought to um, to pass power to his son. So there was fake elections didn't really happen. We have a strong society in the country. Um, and the Arab Spring came in 2011. That was an opportunity for Yemenis. They all came um, and millions into the streets, civil society, uh, students, uh, political um, leaders, tribal leaders, all peacefully, given that Yemen has about uh, 45 million machine guns for each person, maybe three machine guns. They peacefully protested uh, for almost half a year until they moved Saleh. The GCC initiative came in, which is um, the Gulf countries came in with an initiative trying to broker a deal, uh, to broker a deal between the movement and the pl existing political parties. The protest in the Arab Spring was not as organized as it should be. Like they didn't have the leadership and the resources, just like every other protest. But there was an existing political party that was opposing Saleh. Uh, they stayed within that sort of negotiation. They broke a deal where Saleh stepped down in exchange for the immunity. A lot of people rejected that. He walked away with $60 billion. His entire um, uh, system um, was like corrupt and they all given uh, immunity. Not only that, but also he, was, he remained a political actor. They didn't move him and say you can't really play in a political life. He remained, uh, remained to be the head of the most powerful political party in the country. Um, and so he was playing, and most of the army are loyal to him, the tribes are um, loyal to him. So he played that, um, uh, you know, sort of 
uh, game that actually allowed him to go back to the political life, brought the Houthis in um, to the capital. Why does the U.S. To fall into all of I'm, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get to the U.S. So, anyway, so this is what happened. Uh, the Arab Spring, as a result of the Saleh be removed from power, the people given and he and his uh, entire government to be given immunity. Um, there was a negotiation, so they brought all the people from all uh, walks of life, political parties, uh, students, youth, women. Uh, it was a very great sort of, they called the National Conference Dialogue, uh, where about 500 uh, people from the South, North, uh, women, it was like 50% women and third youth, and it was divided in a very good way. Everyone came together. They negotiated how they want the system to be uh, going forward, and there was a negotiation for about Ten uh, months, where they came out with a very good outcomes um, with uh, establishing a federal system. This is how it looks like, because there were grievances in, the, in, the, in the, these are six regions. Um, the way they thought it was like uh, to divide it to make sure people in each region are given autonomy and sort of part of their natural resources, and to have equal, uh, equal access to the system. The uh, the system. The the real problem with the Yemen is that everything was extremely centralized. It was a system that one person controls everything. He points the governors, he points the city officials, he points everything when it's supposed to be a democracy, right? So people on the local level was loyal to the president and instead of, uh, uh, to their own um, people on the ground and their own community to do something for them. And so that's why they thought to create a new federal system, divided into six regions. At that time, everything was drafted, the constitution was drafted after 10 months of talk with include the Houthis were actually part of it and were, they were given about 60 seats and the, the table actually more than a political party got and so everyone was like trying to show the people of Yemen that they were actually trying to do something for the common good so they all were bringing their own good stuff into the table including the Houthis but then Saleh with the, with the Houthis came together imagine after six or seven wars uh, fighting each other they came together because they come from that part of the country that it was controlling the country for about a thousand years. They don't want to lose power. The reason why they came back together because they don't want the country to go into a decentralized system where they lose access to the entire uh, system. So this is what happened. They uh, kidnapped the, the head of the National Dialogue um, when he was delivering the Constitution to the Brethren for the people to vote. They, they staged a coup against the, the government. They put the uh, uh, legitimate uh, Brethren in their home arrest. Um, and so this is what happened, and then the fight broke between Houthis alongside the Saleh against the legitimate government, Arab coalition uh, formed by the Saudi Arabia, UAE, and other countries joined to fight in the Houthis, saying that they're proxy for the Iranians, and that's how the whole um, thing is happening. Um, it's a war. Uh, where did the U.S. Um, uh, stand in this? U.S. Its foreign policy is always bad for Yemenis. Um, they have drones, ongoing drones, for the past decade, um, killing innocent people left and right without any accountability. They actually in bed with Saudi Arabia, and this is their main ally in the region. They've given almost the whole Yemeni situation into the hands of Saudi Arabia and the UAE to do whatever they want to do with Yemen. They provide in logistical support, actually committing crimes against Yemenis. And so everyone is committing crime in the country. Houthis are committing more aggressive and gross human rights violations against uh, Yemenis than the Arab coalition. The Arab coalition equally committed crimes against Yemenis. They targeted mosques, they targeted schools, they targeted uh, um, you know, companies, they targeted almost everything, roads and, and almost everything in the country. It's, it's, the country is like zero, they, they flooded the whole thing. And so now the fighting is still um, going on in the country. Um, you know, as you heard, Saleh was uh, three minutes. Um, Saleh was killed recently by his own allies because of the struggle for power. Saleh was using him, and they was using Saleh. I'm talking about the Houthis, and so they thought they somehow. At the end of the day, they knew one has have to kill the other, but at that time they just needed some sort of unity to overthrow the government and to control the system. And this is exactly what happened. To be clear about the Houthis. People think that the Houthis somehow are against U.S. foreign policy and they fight in for the freedom of Yemeni. They actually do the total opposite. It's a sect 
that is run by a few families. They think they have the God-given rights to control the country. They killed, blew up houses, uh, kidnapped thousands of protesters, political uh, politicians and human rights activists. Um, they recruited children and thousands we, we never seen in Yemen history. They turned um, schools into military bases for the purpose of one family regaining power. Um, so they kind of have a good advocacy uh, to show the world that are actually against the U.S. foreign policy. They not they actually in bed with U.S. right now, fighting Al Qaeda, um, and and the same time with Iran. They use in Iran people in the West trying to downplay the Iranian interference is a strong and it's there. All the media uh, communication of al Houthis are based on. Um, uh, Lebanon, where Hezbollah run the whole thing. So the main TV, the reporters, advocacy groups that go to the UN and Geneva and the US are all based on Lebanon. And so it's, it's clear that there are Hezbollah fighters in the ground and stuff like that. People are trying to downplay that, but that exists. And we know it as Yemenis and we know what's happening in the ground. There is, of course, the Saudis using this as a way to control the country. They don't want a democracy next door. They also, we have a lot of natural resources. There is some misconceptions about Yemen always. Every article that I have read about Yemen, it said the, poor, the Arab poorest country, right? You see it all over. Like no matter what they say in Yemen, they still say the uh, poorest nation in the Arab world. We're not poor. We had the most corrupted system in the world by international, uh, embassy, uh, what do you call it, Transparency International. Everyone knows that Saleh's regime was the most corrupted regime, looting the people's um, money and natural resources. We have oil, we have gas, we have gold, we have islands that we can turn into uh, um, resorts. There's so many things that can be done and we have millions of workers and investors abroad that can, can home, come home if there is a real system that would actually give people equal access. With that said, I'll end it here if you have any questions. <laughs> Later, but we have one more speaker from Amnesty International, and, I, and thank you very much for that. And I hope that you'll stay, I hope that you'll stay to the question and answer period. Um, we now have Shireen Tadros from Amnesty International. She's a broadcast journalist who's worked for Al Jazeera and a number of other well-known institutions. Who's and we thank her for coming. Thank you for inviting me and I'm so heartened to see that so many people came out today to, to hear about Yemen. Um, I was a broadcast journalist for about 13 years and I covered the Middle East and lived in the Middle East and covered Yemen in 2011, the uprising, and then was there around maybe three or four times since March 2015 when the, the current war started. Um, and decided to leave and, and become a human rights advocate in, in large part because of what I saw happening in Yemen and what I was reporting on. And the fact that I felt that my job as a reporter was just to tell everyone what was going on and I felt that I needed to do more and to, and to be part of a movement that tried to change policy. Uh, and that's really what I'm, I, I try and do now in my current job. I'm the uh, Amnesty International representative at the United Nations. I don't work at the United Nations. I don't work for the United Nations before I start getting heckled by people. <laughs> I lobby on human rights priorities and I, and I head our, our team there. Um, yeah, and I would just say that I have been given the impossible task of in the next two, three minutes, and I promise to keep it to two, three minutes, um, to tell you about the humanitarian situation on the ground. So I just want to apologize in advance because I'm going to really lower the tone and of this, um, you know, of this, uh, the mood here, and because it is a very bleak situation, and I can only imagine that the organizers decided if they're going to have someone talk about how sad the situation is they might as well get someone with a British accent and lessen the blow for you, but I don't know if I can, I can even do that. But back in 2015 is when the United Nations actually said that uh, Yemen was a humanitarian catastrophe. That was maybe three or four months after the war had started. And now there aren't words that can describe what's going on. Um, in 2016, the UN looked at its humanitarian response 
and all the crises around the world and decided to devote most of those to Yemen. So they took from Syria, they took from South Sudan um, those who they had on the ground and they actually devoted um, those kind of resources to Yemen. So there was an early warning trigger at the UN where they knew that the situation was, was becoming that catastrophic. So fast forward now to 2018 and the emergency relief um, expert and, and the head of um, OCHA went to Yemen. He came back and gave a recent interview, I think a few weeks ago to Al Jazeera English and when they said to him, can you describe the situation there? He looked at, into the camera and he just seemed like he didn't have the words and he goes, it's like an apocalypse. And, and that's really what people are seeing on the ground. This is really the situation. There's 27 million people in Yemen. 20 million of those rely on humanitarian assistance. That's over 80% of the population. We haven't seen a humanitarian crisis this big in decades. In fact, the UN says in more than 50 years. So as much as I can sit here and give you all of these facts and figures, I can tell you that three million children and women who are either pregnant or breastfeeding are in need um, of food that they're severely malnourished. It's very difficult, unless you, you see it for yourselves, to really appreciate just how terrible the situation is. Um, so, so that's all the, the very sad and, and, the, and the bad news about Yemen. And, and also someone mentioned the cholera outbreak. Again, one of the worst that we've seen in modern times. One million people are now infected. Um, or possibly infected, um, and thousands, so we think over 2,000 have, have been killed because of cholera. And then now I will slightly take issue with, with, with Ibrahim because I agree with, with most of your analysis and, and what you said, but from Amnesty International's point of view, and we've managed to, to, to report quite a lot from the ground, um, there are certainly war crimes being committed by both sides, by the Houthis um, and, and also by the Saudi-led coalition. But by and large, the, you know, the, the, the brunt of, of, of it is being committed by the Saudi-led coalition. They have killed many more civilians as a result of you know, barbaric uh, airstrikes than, than the Houthis have. And it's always very difficult to, to compare these things, you know, is it about how many people you kill or how many children you kill? But, but at the end of the day, when you, when you catalog what the Saudi coalition have done, their targeting of schools and health facilities um, and hospitals, which has brought life in Yemen to a grinding halt, um, it, it's very, very difficult to excuse them in any way. And again, not to say that the Houthis haven't, we've documented um, every time we go, crimes that are being committed by the Houthis that amount um, to possible war crimes, including using child soldiers, uh, torturing, um, imprisoning human rights defenders. Um, but I think that a lot of pressure has to be put on Saudi Arabia and the um, UAE and the, and the Emirates for, for their conduct in this war. And this is where all of you come in, because um, there is no doubt that the US plays a huge influence in this. There are, you know, US commanders. I even met someone recently who described himself as a human rights consultant that sits in the war room um, in Saudi Arabia calling in airstrikes and trying essentially, and he's, he was American, and, and essentially trying to advise as to how they can conduct these airstrikes and not be liable for human rights violations and violations of international law. Um, and it's it's really it, it's really a very sad situation, and it's not just the U.S. It's also the U.K., France, and and the, the most random of countries that continue to arm Saudi Arabia, continue to call Saudi Arabia their, their ally, uh, and this sort of um, hypocrisy really has to stop. And it stops by people getting angry um, and calling out their government. And you should all be very very angry. It doesn't seem right to say thank you after that evaluation, um, but I think it does give you a sign of uh, what is what is going on. Uh, we have one other local uh, Yemeni American who's going to come up and talk for a minute. But I think while we're doing that, we're going to start passing these buckets around. And please.
be very generous, whether it's cash or checks. If you, don't, if you don't have, this is for Yemeni relief. As we said at the beginning, if you don't have money with you, you can also donate later online. If you have friends, uh, there is, there is, uh, you were given uh, papers on all the seats. Here it is, Bentley, BFP to Yemen. And so if you have friends and neighbors who you think would, could also donate to this, please do so. And we will also have someone uh, from Action Against Hunger, which is the organization that is going to be donating the money, and someone from Human Rights Watch who will be talking about the situation while we're collecting our money. Manager for Action Against Hunger. Can you hear me okay? Yes. No. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Right. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer. Um, I work with Action Against Hunger in our New York office. Um, and my day job is as a monitoring and evaluation advisor, which means I work with data and numbers. Um, and I don't talk to people a lot about our programs. Um, but I'm very happy to be here tonight because I care deeply about the Middle East and, and Yemen. Um, and I think the previous presentation outlined very well the um, just how vast this humanitarian crisis is and how tragic the situation is for the people of Yemen. Um, recently, I think uh, the number was reported at 3 million. I've heard the UN estimate that 11 million children are in need of humanitarian assistance. That is literally every single child in Yemen. Um, and Action Against Hunger um, is, has been working in Yemen since 2012, um, providing mostly uh, humanitarian assistance focused on uh, reducing uh, the risk and treating children and their families who are suffering from hunger and malnutrition. Um, we're currently supporting around 40 health facilities. We're running cholera treatment centers. Um, we're providing food assistance um, in the form of cash and food aid. We're um, doing water trucking. We are sending cholera response teams to try to um, trace contacts to try to reduce the spread of the cholera outbreak. Um, and we're doing this work to really, in, in a context that's just really quite unimaginable. I've spoken to colleagues in the region um, just about how difficult accessing some of these populations are um, due to airstrikes, due to blockades, due to fighting. We've had to suspend some of our um, uh, operations around Hodeida um, as the front of the conflict um, has moved. Um, and uh, this is in a context where humanitarian needs continue to rise. Prices have uh, continued to rise. Um, and the amount of uh, relief uh, going into the country um, is nowhere near um, being able to meet the vast amount of needs. Um, and it's also one of the most underreported and misunderstood crises um, around the world. So we're really grateful for your interest and your support tonight. Um, and we, uh, we guarantee as an organization that around 93 percent of all donations go directly to the programs that we're operating, so um, we really appreciate your support. Thank you very much. And Michael Page from uh, Human Rights Watch. Thank you everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Page and I work in the Middle East Division in Human Rights Watch. And first I just want to thank the previous speakers. It's a very hot job for Ibrahim to kind of give a modern history of Yemen in 10 minutes or less. So <laughs> I'm just going to do, you know, kind of three kind of points from, from our perspective. So Human Rights Watch, like Amnesty International, yes, uh, we try to pressure those in power to respect rights. And in Yemen, that's been an incredibly challenging one. And what we've noted is the humanitarian crisis. 
But I think you know, the first point I want to note is that it's not just a humanitarian crisis, it's a man-made catastrophe. So these statistics that you hear, and I'll kind of throw one more out, is that since the conflict escalated in March 2015, uh, five children are killed or wounded every day on average. And so these numbers are in, nearly impossible to kind of absorb, but it's the people on the ground that are fighting that are also kind of creating this. This isn't a natural disaster, it's a man-made one. And specifically, it's the West that is also kind of contributing to this problem. And I want to note that kind of the West is contributing, particularly the UK, France, and the US in several ways. One is the kind of political and diplomatic cover that they're giving to the blockade, which restricts aid, which stops fuel and life-saving aid into the country. But it's also the weapon sales. And so, and this isn't just something that has started with the Trump administration. Maybe some of you remember this kind of photo op when Trump visited Saudi Arabia when he announced $110 billion of sales and they touched a glowing orb, right? This is part of the Obama administration too. Obama administration uh, sold $20 billion uh, in arms sales to Saudi Arabia in 2015. And so our organization, as well as Amnesty, as well as Yemeni NGOs, have tried to do the following. They've tried to document where there have been apparent unlawful airstrikes on the ground. And in many of the cases, I think at least a half dozen, or two, sorry, almost two dozen that we've found, they're US-made weapons that the Saudi-led coalition is using to bomb markets, to bomb schools, to bomb hospitals, right? And what we're trying to do is link that research that we've done, that others have done, and tell our representatives that they need to stop arms sales to Saudi Arabia until they stop killing people on the yeah. right? And so I guess I'll leave with the kind of final point, which is is that pressure, right, from, from us, from organizations like this, and I want to thank Brooklyn for, for peace, for inviting us out, I mean, it's great, I'm now a, I'm not a New York resident, but I now live in New York, I think I need 10 years to get the card, but, uh, you know, I, it's, pressure is building slowly in the political establishment, so, you know, we see that Norway has now stopped arms sales to the UAE because of the Yemen war. Germany has made positive indications about no longer selling weapons to the coalition. Even in, even in the U.S., right, in what a place that the Saudi, Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states have a lot of influence in Congress, we've had multiple votes where bipartisan uh, members in the Senate have tried to halt arms sales. And so even in June 2017, you had, you had I believe, 47 senators uh, trying to stop weapon sales. And I think, you know, what, I'll, what the last kind of point I'll make is, is that we need to continue to pressure our representatives in Congress and in the Senate to make statements that say this war is unacceptable in terms of the civilian loss of life, they need to stop restricting aid, and then we also need to end these arms sales until the Saudis respect human rights in Yemen and domestically. So anyways, I want to thank you very much, and uh, thanks again to the Ibrahim and Shireen to come up for the Q&A, uh, but before we start that, I do want to make sure that you know that there is a rally tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock in Manhattan on 3rd Avenue and 48th Street outside the offices of Senator Schumer and Gillibrand. They're in the same office building in Manhattan, and that rally is in support of Yemen and stopping of U.S. funding, U.S. weapon sales, and the military aid that they're giving, like any air refueling and so forth, to aid the, uh, the Saudi assault on Yemen. Uh, show the next slide. The other thing you can do is to call Congress and tell them that you want the U.S. to stop funding Saudi Arabia for the atrocities that they are committing. The numbers out of the way of the numbers. 877-762. Go back. Yeah, go back. Uh, so again, that's a number you should learn to dial very frequently. And please call them. You can mention this particular uh, resolution that the House is considering, but call your senators too, because their opposition to uh, U.S. support of Saudi Arabia is critical. And the last thing is we do have these 
beautiful posters for sale um, to put in your windows to hang on your wall. They're just $3 when you're leaving. Thank you. And you can join us to help us put them up all around the city. Woo! I just want to uh, announce uh, that the collection here tonight was a thousand twelve dollars. Give yourselves a big round of applause. And, and, and more online. Camp, and, Matt, oh, yeah. and there's six hundred over six hundred no online. Okay, so we're going over. Uh, yeah. We're gonna hit two thousand tonight. We, yeah. we're trying to get one thousand. We've more than succeeded that. And by the way, the uh, person from Action Against Hunger said that ninety-three percent of your donations go directly to aid, but specifically these no. donations and the one online go to their operation in Yemen. Wow. So it really is a very effective donation. Thank you. Uh, you know, I want to thank you very much for being here. Uh, I do have a couple questions, but I'd like, if I can, preface it with a little statement, uh, as I usually do. Um, not too long, so you cut me off. Um, I think the shocking thing about this catastrophe that's going on right before our eyes is that there's no anti-war movement in the United States. How long do we have to wait to stop this? And I think that it's our real responsibility, and I think the way to stop it is, of course, to stop the United States supporting Saudi Arabia and the atrocities there. So that's just a brief statement. My question then becomes um, maybe a little thoughts about how we could build a movement, number one. Number two, I don't also think that it's necessary at all for us to take any position about the internal dynamics of politics in, in Yemen. We, of course we need to learn the history, but it's not for us to take a stand that's counterproductive to building a movement in the United States. We have to have certain demands, that is U.S. end of the money to Saudi Arabia, stop the atrocities and end the military uh, action from all sides. And I think if we know that, then we could build a movement. So my question then becomes is, also I'd like to know a little bit about the Yemeni community in the United States, what their thoughts are. And I'd like to know, so I have two questions. One is, <laughs> I have like 15 have questions, questions but I'll narrow it to two. Number one is, um, I'm curious about the Yemeni community. Number two, I'm interested in what your thoughts on building a movement and what those demands and um, can be. Sure, and, and, I, and I just have to say that I, I, I have to leave in about 10 minutes, so maybe um, I'll, 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 <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take a few questions and then, and then go. But just, I mean, to answer you, as a, someone, someone said that the Yemen war was a forgotten war. I don't think it's a forgotten war, it's an ignored war. The Yemen war is, is one that has been covered by journalists, not enough. But it has been covered by journalists. If you, if you compare to Burundi, which gets absolutely zero attention, um, it's just ignored, and it's ignored because um, it's being conducted by Western powers, and, and there's so much financial interest there. I mean, and, and we are living in a really difficult time. I mean, the reason why the, the UK does continues, you know, to to arm Saudi Arabia and, and is because is in the context of Brexit and the fact that it cannot afford right now to turn its back on this ally financially, economically, and, and, and you know, the US has its own financial, you know, also implications. So I think that it, it, it goes pretty deep, but in, in terms of what we can do, awareness raising is, is a big one. And to come out of sort of just talking amongst ourselves, because we all know that we are liberals and we are left-leaning and we, um, you know, we have empathy towards others, and actually start speaking to, to our neighbors or people, you know, at work or whatever, and sort of tell them about what's going on in Yemen. And because a lot of it is just sort of pure, um, you know, ignorance and not and not knowing really what's going on there. And I think the first step is that people know about what's going on and then you get angry and then you write to to your representatives uh, and and some momentum has to grow from that. But without any 
real sort of impetus for these leaders to feel that their populations are angry about this, then you know why would anything change? And the Saudis have been very clever at blockading not just goods and food and so on, but also not allowing human rights investigators and not allowing journalists into the country. So, to challenge. Yeah, just to briefly respond, um, before I get into the, uh, the answer, um, I just want to make clear that the Houthis and the Arab coalition, like by the UAE and, the, and uh, Saudi Arabia, equally, and I said that, equally committed crimes against humanity. So I'm not giving anyone a break or one over the other. However, um, everything was documented. We're talking about the numbers that were documented by friends and human, uh, human Rights Watch, MSC International, and, and, and I would like to thank them for their efforts. However, the reporting are only on certain sites, not on every site in Yemen where crimes were committed against Yemenis. And we're talking about, for example, Al Bayla. I don't think any NGO has gone really explored that city that many crimes and landmines and stuff were committed by the Houthi militia. So all the numbers out there are similar. They say the numbers are close between the Houthis and the, and the Saudi led coalition. However, the reality is still way different. No one organization, no one party can document everything that's happening in a, in, in a country. But what we need is accountability, right? I don't think even in a future negotiation, political negotiation, that immunity should be given to anyone. I think we need to make sure that it's clear when there is any political negotiation that the war lords not, not to be on the table like they did in the first place. So this is the problem in Europe. Going back to the um, Yemeni American community, we actually are a target right now by the Muslim man. We have people, um, there are thousands of Yemeni American families stuck in Djibouti, Malaysia, and right. Egypt. And right now, I've been working on the Muslim ban cases, about a couple hundred people who, some of them, most of them, their visas were approved, right. were revoked afterwards just in the past right. weeks. So basically, we are going, there's a war against us by the US government here. So if you come through the airport, you're being stopped for, um, Hours and hours and hours. I have my sister and niece and nephews, 12 years old and 8 years old, just came in uh, last month. Actually, the kids were interrogated and were asked, why you came to, why are you coming to the U.S.? Um, you're talking about a U.S. citizen was born in the U.S. asked, why are you coming back to the U.S.? Um, so there's a lot of things that are committed against Yemeni. They actually, we can't go anywhere right now. Uh, even the two countries that we used to go without any visas, like Egypt, and, um, and Jordan, now we can't even have, we, we have to apply for the visas. Um, you're talking about 27 million people cannot go in and outside the country uh, because there's a complete blockade by the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, there is no flights and only one Yemeni flight that might fall at any time. Um, that carrying, how, how many people they, they can carry uh, between Yemen and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, so we can't go back to the country. Hardly can ship money or food or anything. There's no commercial going, going to the country. So there's a lot of things that are happening to Yemen. Even if they allow us to, to do our own stuff, we can be in a way better position if they open the ports and the seaports and the airports. So right now, not a lot of people can leave the country. We have millions of people in Saudi Arabia, um, the Gulf countries, elsewhere and in the US. We can't do anything anymore because we can't move anymore. Um, and if you're trying to come to the US to join your family, you are banned. So there is a lot of difficulties for the Yemeni American community, targeted by law enforcement, question of the airports, uh, treated as a second class citizen. So there is a lot of things that we go through right now. That's beside trying to support our families back home. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, hi, my name is Rabia Debani, Rabia Athabani. I am a Yemeni American community activist. I have known Ibrahim since I was a little girl. We organized for years on end against the Saleh regime in Yemen. Um, and we organized also when the Houthis came into Sana'a because we're totally against militias, militia rule, okay? But I am going to totally disagree with Ibrahim when he talks about, it, you know, that there are war crimes committed on an equal level when you talk about the Saudi, into, this is where I mean Ibrahim may differ on this issue. The Saudis and the coalition have committed the majority of the crimes in Yemen. Okay, we are fueling and supporting and financially that we are making this possible. This one of the most I have no words because my husband is banned as well, by the way. Okay, 
I have no words to describe the kind of pain and suffering, and you know what I mean. I'm but our people are sorry. going through that, you know, you know, you know that. We both know that, I'm sorry. I don't mean to. The kind of suffering and pain that we're going through because of the Saudi intervention, and I had, from the very beginning, knew that when there's an outside intervention into this internal conflict that we had, and I totally agree with you, that it was going to make it tenfold, ten, a thousandfold worse than it, it was already. And so, I ha and I will, I have to say this. I, I have questions. First of all, there's no freaking military solution to the conflict in Yemen. You are not, no way, going to get rid of the freaking Houthis who are Yemenis, by the way, at the end of the day. Okay, the you're not, I agree, but you're not going to totally eliminate them. There's no military solution. We know this. The Saudis went into this, started bomb bombing Yemen in, in, in March of 2015 and said it's going to take them two weeks. It's three years now. Three years. We know that. We all know that. They have to come to the table. There's got to be a political solution. The only solution is a political solution. There's no other solution. Halas. That's it. There's nothing else. How many people have to starve to death, have to die from preventable diseases, have to what? How many more before we are honest with ourselves as a community who is, by the way, victimized twice by the war in Yemen and now by the fucking Trump I'm sorry. Yeah. Administration! <laughs> what the hell? Yeah. After one. Yeah. yeah, the question is, is that, <laughs> do you agree with, or do you believe that there is no military solution? The only solution is political solution. Of course. I believe you do. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it is important to, you know, we all oppose the U.S. foreign policy in Yemen, right? There's no question about that. Uh, when I talk about what's happening on the ground, I'm not talking about it in the, uh, from a Yemeni-American perspective. I'm talking about it from also the struggles that are happening on the ground, right? If it's all about peace and a true democracy, then we need to look at the picture as a whole. Saudi Arabia committing along the, the other part that no one is talking about, the UAE. They committed the most massacres in Yemen. They they created militias and as they run in um, secret detention like the Guantanamo sort of style. Uh, they killing people that are actually posing the US and the UAE in the South. Um, they created militias. So the claim that they kind of, I'll, I'll be honest, at the beginning, I would say the vast majority of Yemenis were actually with the Arab coalition until they found out that actually they not in there to restore the legitimate, legitimate government as they claim they are. Because what they're doing right now is undermining the actual government they claim to support. They're creating militias all across the south. They're creating uh, detentions. Um, they occupying all Yemeni islands and building military bases without the Yemeni government consent. So this is a very important to note that they're not there for Yemeni, they're not there to restore the government. They're there for their own interests, is to contain Yemen, to control Yemen, and to be all about humanitarian, right? Right now, I think the humanitarian issue is a political issue because the roots of it is a political, but they're using it as a way for Yemeni to accept any political solution. When we talk about political solution, we need to think about what kind of political solution in here. Are we talking about Saudi puppets and Houthis, the people that actually came together to kill Yemenis and committed massacres? This is the thing that I'm talking about right here. We can't have criminals to be at the negotiating tables. Now, you can have any political solution. There is a roadmap there about having a peaceful solution from the outcome of the national dialogue. Let me finish. So, Saudis are committing um, crimes against humanity along with the UAE, and so are the Houthis. Now, as Americans, of course, we have to impose uh, or against, I mean, to go against the U.S. Uh, foreign policy because they only support in the Saudis. They're committing crimes along the Saudis by providing logistical support. So they are in bed with what the Saudis and the UAE are doing in Yemen. But at the same time, there's someone who asked earlier about not allowing, are we only going to care about it from the U.S. perspective? But from a Yemeni's perspective, it's slightly different. If you are saying, let's not support Yemenis, Yemenis be, need protection from militias, from X, Y, and Z. So if we just allow the Houthis do whatever they want to, and that's not our issue, if it's about democracy and about peace, we need to hold 
anyone who committed crimes against humanity accountable, and not just to take about to think about it from the U.S. foreign policy uh, piece. That's an important piece that we need to target, but also we need to hold all the other actors accountable, and that can be done can by supporting the people of Yemen. Okay. 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 So, so um, uh, obviously there, there, there are there's strong passions around this. I would ask people now, please, to ask a question. I understand that people have points of view, but I would ask you, please, to ask a question. And in fact, to encourage that, I'm going to ask, get uh, three questions. I'm going to ask, you know, three questions, and then you can respond to all three. So please, ask a question. Yeah. Um, can you hear me through the mic? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I think it's also important to put this in the context of the larger chaos in the Middle East. Condoleezza Rice, around uh, 2001, 2002, talked about how it was time to redo the Middle East, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, my question is, uh, I've read reports that there are actually U.S. troops on the ground in Yemen. So I'd like to know if you know anything about that. And um, if you, if there any, what's the role of Israel in all of this? Are they playing any kind of a role? I'd be surprised if they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, can, can you? I don't think I can reach all the way back there. Somebody should ask. Hi, this is directed to Shireen. My name is Larry Everest. I write, I help cover Yemen for RevolutionRevCom.us. And I share your outrage. I am so angry that this country, America, has so much Yemeni blood on its hands. It's committing war crimes. It's murdering children. It makes me sick. And we have to let every person in this country know that no, America isn't a force for good in the world. It's murdering children. And I would like you to expand on what you started to get into about how the U.S is facilitating through refueling, through intelligence, through logistics, through selling weapons, including cluster bombs, what role they're playing in this devastating blockade, the Navy, and by the way, the Houthis don't have an Air Force or a Navy, excuse me. Um, I wish you would really go into this, because this is something we have to indict this government, and, it's, and I'd like you to talk about how it's being escalated under Trump pants. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 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 that's why I have the mic. No, I'm just putting it on real. Thank you. 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 Uh, my name is Salah Kuleib. I just uh, ran away from the war before like uh, less than two years. And ولكن <تصفيق> أكلت 26 سبتمبر. أنا أنا بس حابب تعقيب أولاً لأنه السؤال بالأخير لكن. So basically he's saying you know this whole thing is about you know the U.S. and Yemen did the mutual sort of there is an interest between the the coalition and whatever like mainly it's all about money and stuff like that. But also, you know, U.S. in the past was supporting Saleh, um, and he was just the head of it, not the actual problem. Yeah, Saleh لو تحالفات كبيرة جدا قبلية دينية عصبوية من أولهم أكبرهم هو كان عبد الله بن الأحمر. عموما السؤال الحقيقي هل تعتقدون إنه بمجرد إنه أمريكا لم تدعم السعودية هل هناك ستوقف الحرب هل ستوقف القتل هل ستصلح اليمن لا. اليمن مشكلة أكبر من توقيف الأسلحة السعودية اليمن أيضا مشكلة مع احترامي وشعوركم الرائع بالتبرعات مشكلة اليمن أكبر من التبرعات 
مشكلة اليمن حل كبير جدا لازم يكون في تدخل عسكري قوي وما تنتهيش ما ينتهيش إلا بامتداد عصابة صنعاء هذه والتفكيك لازم يستمر. So, um, yeah, let's take another question. So, we have three questions that we would like you to answer. Okay, we have one more. How about interpreting so what he just said? I, I, I'll be happy. I'll be happy. Yeah. So, in English, so, that we can read. So, what he, what he, do you want me to translate that? Yeah. So, what he was saying is that um, donation or trying to just to target the U.S. foreign policy is not going to end the war and not going to solve the war. The word is bigger than that. You think he was asking you, do you think that by stopping selling weapons to the Saudi Arabia and, you know, this is, I'm trying to be assured, do you think it's going, the war is going to stop? Um, okay. So we have one other question and I, I guess people no, wait, There's three already asked. What? There were already three well, we have, we have this, this gentleman. Yeah, yeah, and he also said that we should intervene by military. Wait, what? Wait, say it again. Question, he suggested question, that, um, the, that, uh, that a solution to Yemen was a military intervention. I don't know. No, okay. Ask this question. So, in the year 1990, there were two countries at the UN Security Council who voted against the U.S.'s bombing or attempt to bomb, at the time, Iraq. The countries were not Russia that opposed it, but not China. It was Cuba, was the one country, and the other one was Yemen. And the U.S. government told Yemen that's the most expensive no vote you're ever going to vote. And they've been paying that ever since. So, and the U.S. government, unlike the rest of us, have long memories for who's on their side and supporting their interests. So my question is, where are the banks in which Saudi Arabia and the UAE have their funds deposited in the U.S. Who runs those banks? Where do they live? And how do we go get it? Uh, so, 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 so to recap, we, have, we would like you both to answer. Um, we have the question about Israel's role. Uh, we have a question about finance. And just US troops, and, US troops US and troops whether or not US role. troops are actually on the ground. No, and the US role in carrying and the US out war role, crimes yeah. I mean, and the blockade. I'll, I'll go first because because I have to go, but um, uh, there's a lot there's a lot there and very very interesting questions. A lot of it I can't answer just because I do you know I do represent Amnesty International. And we don't weigh into the the political situation. I am here to talk to you about the war crimes being violated and the humanitarian situation. Um, U.S. boots on the ground. It's been suggested many times. As I told you, U.S. involvement. Um, th there is an active involvement in the war. Have we documented U.S. troops on the ground as Amnesty International? No, we haven't. Um, but quite honestly, the U.S. don't need boots on the ground to call in the airstrikes. The UAE are doing that. So I don't even know if it's even relevant with technology these days to to, to you know put such fine a point of, of, of you know soldiers on the ground. Um, and for the question, you know, thank you for the question about the, the exact U.S. involvement. I think my colleague from Human Rights Watch really, uh, you know, very succinctly told you about the the extent of U.S. involvement, and it, and it ranges from the very small and the sort of the rhetoric, the the enabling of, of, of Saudi Arabia not to be seen as a pariah state because countries like the U.S. but also others see them as friends, and the U.S. president goes and you know holds a soul, sword and dances around with the pre you know, and, and and all of this goes to really send a message that this is a, a state that is an ally. Um, you know, he's not going to go and do that. Um, you know, with with Hamas. Is he, or with you know with, with those that the world considers to be terrorists, or and, and Saudi Arabia should really be put into that um, yeah. that category. Yeah. So, and I think it's just that sort of that image and that and that rhetoric. And then there's real material support, real financial support that's out in the open that you can read about in the New York Times. The the trade deals, the um, economic deals, the the military support, and the actual support that I that I that I mentioned that people that there are actual you know American military and advisors in the control room. Um, and they and they there was a point at which the U.S. and the U.K. really showed off to Amnesty International and to Human Rights Watch. They were in the control.
control room, as if that was, you know, that was showing that they were really trying to control the Saudis. They don't really talk about that anymore because there have been so many of these strikes that have killed civilians yes. that, you know, it's it's clearly shown that they are complicit. And we have also documented, um, as Amnesty International and also as in my time as a journalist, um, went and was um, privy to seeing, uh, you know, incredible amount, a wash with weapons that had US and British logos and, and signs and, 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 and numbers on them. Um, so it, it's it's not even something that's controversial to say. It's it's really become an old story. We keep saying the same thing. There is just the material support, there's, you know, financial support. It, it goes on and on and on. There is absolutely no... Um, you know, there's no controversy here about that everyone should... What's that? Blockade. How about the blockade and the role of the U.S. in that? Is there one, and what is it? The role of the U.S. is the same, to be honest, as, as many other countries, which is to put pressure on Saudi Arabia. The U.S. has that influence on Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the truth is that when Donald Trump last month, probably because he was upset at what the Saudis said about Jerusalem, but when he, when, when he, you know, when he tweeted and, and released a very short statement, as it was, about the blockade, and that Saudi needs to stop that and, and get their act together, we saw a, a, we saw a result days later where the Saudis started to open up a little bit. Um, Hodeida port isn't open to commercial goods, but it started to open up in that, in, 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 in sort of, in a way that at least um, showed that they had listened to what the US president had said publicly. So I think that there is, you know, you putting pressure on your representatives that will in turn put pressure on the president will make a tangible difference on the ground, make no mistake. Yeah, going back to the, whether the US have troops on the ground, um, clearly from the reports they have advisors at least, uh, there was a U.S. Navy person was killed there months ago when they were ta targeting the so-called Al-Qaeda. Um, so they involved in the whole thing. They they provided the logistical support to the Saudis. I, I don't think the Saudis can run any military plane without the the um, the U.S. support. Um, they actually the warships in the sea. I don't think the Saudis are capable of doing anything without the main support of the U.S. Actually, maybe they end the picture for the U.S. The U.S. wants them to be there deeply so they can sell weapons and, and control them and threaten them with war crimes because I think the one that is blocking mainly the international, you know, blocking the UN Human Rights Council from uh, having uh, an independent committee to investigate all the crimes uh, is the U.S. mainly on, on the Saudi side. Um, and, and, and even, the U.S. went against their own citizens. For example, when the war broke, we had about 30,000 Yemeni Americans living in Yemen. The warships were there at the water, and they refused to evacuate U.S. citizens. We had to sue them, and they still refused to evacuate a U.S. citizen, while at the same time providing military support targeting Yemenis, including U.S. citizens by the, by the U.S. The U.S. is a big part of it. As, as long as, I mean, about the, the um, the Israeli sort of thing, everything is possible. I haven't heard anything, I haven't seen anything, but that's part of the Houthi propaganda and like the main thing is like they tell in Yemeni that they're fighting mainly the US and the Israelis. That's their main sort of talking points. Uh, that's how they recruit people in the ground, is that the word it's against US and the Israelis. Um, I don't know, so everything is possible. Uh, but the main people that are committing crimes against Yemeni right now, Saudi Arabia, UAE with the back of USA and, 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 and the UK. So that's the main actors that are taking place um, right now in the country. I don't know if there's anything else that I missed. But. Oh, the drones thing. The drones taking place every day. They strike in, in every part of the, of the country and, and they've gone in an accountable. I, I don't think there's announcements about the drone, drone strike, but they actually target and people all over the place. I don't know if they, the US needs really uh, uh, you know, boots on the ground, when they actually have in militias and, and people like the UAE and the Saudi Arabia doing the job for them on the ground, and then they just <coughs> provide the support by air. So. I think we have, uh, we'll take these two questions and that will be. Um, hi, um, there's two things. Uh, one is a shameless plug. I'm a member of New York City Democratic Socialist of America. We're going to be formulating a campaign around the war in Yemen. And, I'm sorry, I'm a member of NYC DSA. We're forming a campaign around this particular issue, so I'm here to meet people and talk to people and whatever, and our 
we've, we hold our meetings at the beginning of the month, a Catholic worker in the Lower East Side, if you're interested, come see myself or my comrade then. Uh, my question, sorry, is um, related to the bar, so you made a very good presentation uh, from Human, Human Rights Watch um, regarding um, sort of what we should be demanding of our senators and our Congress people uh, and lawmakers um, about the idea that we should be pushing them to end aid to the Saudis until the Saudis respect human rights. But I, I, I'm curious about what people who work for Amnesty or HRW think about, um, does that not set a low bar for what we're looking for to some degree? Because I know that you don't comment necessarily on the conflicts themselves and the internal dynamics per se, like over on the politics, but shouldn't there, I've never in my lifetime seen a war where smart bombs don't kill kids. Like I've never seen a humane war fought in a way that uh, limits the damage to civilian populations. And somehow America always seems to fight enemies who use kids as human shields. Like somehow, like they're always around. So I guess I'm curious about the politics of that, like setting the bar too low. Instead of demanding like, look, we just want the Saudis to have a more humane war, we should tell them to stop bombing the country, <laughs> you know? And that's sort of the bar that at least I think we should be setting, and I'm curious what you guys have to say about it. And we have a question right next to you. Hi, thank you both so much. Um, you're saying, um, we're saying there cannot be a military solution, and there needs to be a negotiated solution, but you're very correctly saying, if only the war criminals are at the table, what kind of solution is it? So who could be, who should be brought to the table? Who, who, what are the elements within Yemen that should be brought to the table? So, um, you want to and, and my uh, final question. Ask me a question. Final question. Is ISIS involved? Thank you. All of those are for you. I mean, maybe I'll just take a, a stab. And again, I'm very much restricted. I know my colleague from HRW is too. And on, on the sort of, you're right that at the end of the day, that we we can't ask people to. Um, to call for a ceasefire, we, that's just not what we get involved in and the reason why we don't get involved in that so that we can have that neutral point of view so that you believe us when we say that this, these are these people are committing war crimes and, and these people aren't. It's just not what we do, this sort of the, the political maneuvering um, of it. But yeah, I think that everyone should, should think for themselves what they are, what they want to ask um, their, you know, their representatives to do. And the only thing I'd say is that there's a bigger question as to weapons and, and the banning of weapons. And there are conventions, international conventions, that, that ban cluster munitions and, and also some of the, the bombs that we're seeing um, being used that, that certainly are, 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 you know, far from being smart. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, and they're, but international law is flawed because international law was created by the parties, the member states who really just wanted to protect themselves from being prosecuted in the future. So we shouldn't necessarily take that as, as you know, as, as the ultimate. Everything that we're saying, you know, you should absorb and think what your line is, what your bar is. Don't let us influence you, but we, we're just, you know, we, we're making our calls in the in the context and the limitations that we can. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with you. I, I haven't seen a lot of people calling for accountability. No one is pushing for the International Criminal Court to prosecute these criminals and to use that as a deterrence for the future. Uh, we can't just talk about stopping the bomb and stopping X, Y, and Z. When we not, how is that going to stop the war from going forward? Right? Uh, there's enough weapons in Yemen to, to continue attacking. While this is an important, we need to call to ban weapons to these countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. We need to call for an accountability. We need to push for the International Criminal Justice to actually intervene. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the ICC, International Criminal Court, and that could be done by pushing the International Human Rights, the UN Human Rights Council to have an independent committee to go and investigate all crimes by all sides. That, pe people of Yemen need accountability, they need justice. And I think if we talk about that piece alongside with the weapons, because that's part of it. Part of it is that accountability. If we, people don't know, and political leaders, that there is no accountability, What's going to stop them from the work? If it's at the end of the day about the people and about democracy and about justice and peace, we need to stand with the people and know what the people's demands are. And these are the, the, the people's demand to hold these war criminals, um, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Houthis accountable so they can achieve peace. There's an important point that like, if we don't bring the criminals to the tables, who else to bring? 
I don't think the people right now in the table represent the Yemenis. How do you know there were an uprising in Yemen, millions of people in the street, people who call for peace, for the democracy, for the federal system, they're not at the table. Actually, the criminals are at the table right now. And so, now the UN, now the country that are actually trying to bring people to talk, they only bring in people that no one likes and everyone hates, <laughs> right? Uh, and people that are actually fighting and using the word as a way to gain political uh, part of the, the power, right? So they're not there to you know, move the country forward or achieve accountability and justice or even to advance the country economically. They're there for their own groups or personal interests, which doesn't represent the 27 million people interests. And I think if we're trying to bring people of peace, there are a lot of uh, women's groups, there are a lot of youth groups, there are a lot of other groups on the ground, but they don't have the mainstream media, they don't have countries backing them. And now, since we put everything in the hands of the Saudis, it is almost impossible to have anything else other than something imp imposed by the US and the UAE and Saudi Arabia and the UK and Yemen. And we don't want anyone to impose anything on Yemenis because that's gonna restart the war. If there is no accountability that would make sure going forward there is no wars, there is no people who would restart war again because we've given immunity to peoples, we given we had a political uh, talk in the past and it was great, it was peaceful. But then what? People use weapons and do the same thing. So yes, that is no military solution, but I don't think, I think certain groups need to be weakened. They need to hand in their weapons when they go to a political talk. So they can, you can't go to a, a peace negotiation um, putting a gun in someone's head to make something. That's something we can't. Well, forever, war forever, or what? No, there is no war forever. This is what a lot of the Islamists say. We need to fight them until we eliminate them. There's no there way, but no I don't even know that. It's three we years. It's like two weeks. I'm so sorry. I want, I want to thank you very much. There is some reports. I don't know if there is any ISIS. They say there's some reports in here. I think it's a part of the international propaganda to keep war going on in Yemen. Uh, I haven't seen real reports of leader for leaders of ISIS. There's Al Qaeda, and it's obvious. But you know, we we're gonna have new militias that are created by the UAE and Saudi Arabia. They're gonna look like ISIS and Al Qaeda in the future if we don't stop that now. So that's part of the problem. There is some reports, but I think it's more of you know, go in there, bomb, and continue to do what you I want to thank you both, and I want to thank the audience also. There was a good exchange by you. And again, remind you tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, um, on 3rd Avenue and 48th Street, in front of Schumer's Little Grand's office. And call Congress. Thanks all for coming. Folks, if you did not give to Action Against Hunger tonight, you can do so at home on your computer. Go to the bit.ly link that is on the paper we handed out. It's bit.ly forward slash BFP, like the for peace, BFP, number two, Yemen, BFP, Yemen.